Daniel has worked in the legal department of Audi AG for 18 years, and at present, he's an in-house counsel in charge of providing legal advice to technical purchasing production and quality assurance departments. His experience in open source software dates back to 2004, which except for people like Mark and me is the, the, the Stone Age. Right? Uh, and currently he and his team uh, advise the various departments of Audi on all open source matters, including compliance. Previously, Daniel was part of an exchange program with VW, um, which could have used your skills, as you know, from a longer period. Uh, and from 2005 to 2008, he, he was in Dubai, in the UAE, uh, working on uh, uh, supporting sales. So uh, it, the, the global automobile industry and its relationship to free software, if the greatest expertise available is his. Uh, and therefore, skepticism, too, I believe. Um, uh, the question is, uh, we have these ideas. Now it's time for the automobile industry to kick the tires. Would you mind doing so for me, please? Thank you. Well, please welcome Daniel Putnai. Anything you need? Get a microphone if you want in the presentation. Yeah. I guess. Is this it? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, hello. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, first of all, I would like to start with an excuse. Please excuse my English. My English is not as good as Eben's uh, and maybe Mark's uh, English. I'm a native German lawyer, and uh, so forgive if I'm lacking some, some English words. Um, I'm trying to do my best. Um, I also um, have to state that whatever I'm going to present today is a statement of me personally. It's not an official statement of my employer, Audi AG. But however, you can, you can and will see how I, I understand things and, of course, how we in the automotive industry see some of the um, points which have been raised also here by, by Eben and by Mark. I think it's a very very interesting topic and uh, we are deeply working on it and uh, yeah but there are a lot of challenges which were already highlighted by uh, both of you which is absolutely right so we are in a very um, complex matter and very complex area and um, I would like to give you an, an industry view and, and view of, of how that can be seen from the automotive uh, industry perspective. For all of you who are maybe not uh, so familiar, familiar with uh, TiVo and the TiVo case, TiVo from my point of view is a term for a security measure which is in the due course already widely used in commercial products, not only the automotive industry, but any other industry, um, which shall prevent a special software, which is maybe signed or not signed, um, from running on a specific system. So that means the user cannot, so he, might, he may change software, but he cannot um, install the, such a modified version of a software uh, of a software component. Um, this, however, and um, this is in general in a, a kind of a conflict, is however required by uh, open source license. Um, in this case, um, as I, I put it up here, um, the hardware checks of a software um, or an, uh, for an expected signature um, are there and uh, if the, the system notices that there is a change, it shuts down um, if he finds out that there's not a match. So wh whatever has been checked before isn't there or has been modified. Um, this can be done by using built-in flash routines um, which may require those checks, those checks um, in, a, in, a, in a hardware. The term TVoization, as I have it up here, um, is uh, 
derived from a specific case, the, the TiVo case, um, uh, TiVo and Linux. Um, um, I think the, the general topic there was a, a digital video receiver. Um, it contained Linux, GNU, uh, which was under uh, the um, GPL version 2. The source code for the system was available, but it contained a technical blocking um, device which prevented users from running um, any modified version um, of, of a software. And the F Free Software Foundation took over, took out the case, complained that, they're, um, that, they're, that the users at the end were prevented from using or from exercising their freedom to change, to alter, and to um, exercise at least their right to do changes and operate it um, um, in, in the system. The third aspect which I want to touch here is, um, yes, that's, 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 that was the case, but in the autom automotive industry, I think we have security and safety um, issues. We want to prevent that, that we have kind of manipulation. Um, and why, do we, why, why is that important to us? It's important to us because we want to safeguard um, our products and, uh, and, and therefore we have, of course, signature checks um, through um, secure boot, chain of trust, and this is widely used um, without a possibility to release uh, signature checks. And I think the topic in the later day today, which talks about autonomous cars, um, and this is what I put up here as a small uh, picture illustration here. This is the, a little bit of the threat, and I think Mark and, and, and Aben, you have been touching on that as well. This is the thread we see. Imagine autonomous cars um, with a software modified by users. So this is just a, a general, a very flashlight. Here, you can, you can think now, autonomous cars are coming to the cities, are being tested. We are reading a lot about what's happening. Um, now also the countries, the cities, um, the states are trying to regulate and try to get, get permissions, um, who can use it and who can do it. But um, now imagine not only the car manufacturer will do a, a certain software algorithm um, to do that um, kind of, uh, to produce that kind of software, but also maybe a customer, uh, a user will, will, uh, will work on that and then ultimately run his car on that kind of software and that at, at the end of the day, the car is in the, uh, <clears throat> on the roads and uh, some difficulties might occur, which then start from um, personal injury to, to even more dangerous issues. So this is the, the thread in a, in a very um, high abstract way where we see, but I also want to go and, and dive more into the deep um, what that means at the end of the day. And of course, if you have questions, please always raise your hands and, and, we, can, and we can ask you. I put up this nice, uh, very un uncomplicated slide here. Um, it looks very, very high dense with information, but um, I think I, I'm just gonna, gonna explain it to you um, what it means and of course, it starts with open source, source software. I'm tr we try to cluster uh, software a little bit in that way. Of course, everyone can do the clustering on its own way. This is the way I, I see the things or we see the things. And, um, but of course, there are, there are different, very, different ways um, to, to cluster a software and to look at it. So we have said open source software can be um, di um, differentiated in strong copyleft a limited copyleft and without copyleft. And I have, I have listed the, the different, the major and, and the most important uh, open source licenses 
here from GPL version 3 to 2 up to BSD and Apache. Now if you look at all of those um, open source licenses, we can look at the, maybe I, st I start with the, the green part and whatever is green here is, uh, whatever is in the, in the green box has, a, has an explanation here. I shouldn't walk away too far from my microphone. Um, so you can all hear me. So if you look at the green part, um, we can we can find out, and if you look at the licenses, you will find out that most li licenses which are marked with a green um, uh, frame, that those licenses do not collide with um, the TiVo case or TiVoization. There are no specific TiVoization clauses, wording which is seen in in the in, in GPL. Um, and or other uh, non-copyleft uh, licenses. Um, implementation and system with hardware um, and therefore signature checks is possible. So I think this is also a very uh, important message that there is already software out there which allows both the things. First of all, signature checks, but also using open source software. So that's that's uh, that's an important point, and if you and if you see um, very up there in, in the high part is GPL version uh, two, which, from my perspective, um, allows signature checks, uh, but nevertheless using open source software. Now, if we come to the yellow part, which is uh, LGPL version two point one or um, GPL version three. For example, with the runtime exception, um, here we can see that we have we might have a diversity of interpretation for some of the um, uh, open source licenses. There is no specific. If you look at the LGPL version 2.1, there is no specific um, provision in the license um, which relates to um, the, the tivoization uh, of a software. But, um, as I stated it up here, the wording relates and refers to exchange. Exchange means the customer needs to be in a position to exchange, to alter, to change the code. Um, the exception provision here is liberating from the strong requirements of GPL. Um, you could possibly understand it, uh, that this could be interpreted in a way that includes, that it includes the, uh, the tivoization issue. So that's, but that's also, that's all part of uh, interpretation. It's not a very clear understanding, at least from my side, what that means at the end. But there's a possibility of interpretation towards tivoization. And then the top part, which are the red um, licenses, which I have listed here, including GPL version 3. Point, uh, uh, version 3, where it's clearly stated t that tivoization is prohibit prohibited um, in uh, any new version of the of the uh, of the uh, of the license, which is as I have stated here, it's uh, GPL 3, it is AGPL 3 or um, LGPL 3. Um, which clearly and verbally interdicts um, tivoization. Um, a license compliant implementation of a, of a tivo, tivoize, tivoized, um, sorry, system is only possible from my understanding if um, uh, we have a release of the possible signature keys. So this is a way how you can cluster um, and the open source, free and open source software licenses, and uh, you can have a view on what that means on how this relates to tivoization. Often discussed, that's how I start my next slide, is uh, LGPL 2.1, where you've seen, uh, if you remember from the page before, it's in the yellow, it's over here, it's in the yellow, and it's in a yellow button or in a yellow corner. What does it mean 
if we talk about and if, if we see and look towards a exchangeability and the tivoization issue, what is, and then maybe it, it also relates a little bit to, to other licenses as well, LGPL 2.1 states that the system shall operate properly if the user exchanges and modifies the LGPL components. I've, I've put down also part of the license. I don't know if you're able to read it. It's a little small, but um, it's highlighted in the yellow part here. And I can read it out so you can read it. Uh, you can understand it so that the user can modify the library and then relink to produce a modified ex executable um, containing the modified library. Or, which is then uh, 6.b, will operate properly with a modified version of the library if the user installs one. So tvoization, if we make a secure uh, a security check, the, at, at the end of the day prevents an exchange of software components so that the user is not able to exchange uh, um, LGPL 2.1 components in tvoized um, systems and gets a running system. Yet, I, at least from my point of view, I have not seen a specific clause interdicting and tvoization as it is, as I said and I mentioned before on the slide before, was inserted uh, for version 3.1 of the GPL. There's no specific jurisdiction or law cases on the speci specific topic up to now. So, from my point of view, it's a question of interpretation of the license text. If GPL version 2.1 interdicts um, tvoization um, or not. Sorry. So, what are the um, different way of interpreting um, that license or the exchangeability of the license? I have listed here four ways of interpretation. You can have a very panicked interpretation and say, okay, we have to avoid, and this is up to a, a company policy, of course, um, within your companies or your organizations. You can have a very panicked interpretation and say, okay, we have to avoid all possible risks and interdict the use of uh, open source software, copy left components, LGPL or even GPL in entirely. That means you are not going to implement GNU, GNU, Linux-based operating systems, possibly as LGPL 2.1 or even GPL version 3 components are included. I put it here, is that, is that maybe outdated? That's what I have also even and Mark talked about it. Linux is widely used in the industry. So, as you said, you're, if you are not, if you are too strict on that, you might lose the path to innovation. So that's absolutely a right point. That's why I, I put it here as a, as a cloud. You can also have a. This is the, maybe the next level. It's a conservative uh, interpretation. There's a potential legal risk for non-compliance because of the way of interpretation of that clause. You can avoid implementation of such a software in, in your TVOI-sized um, systems or in technical uh, construction or for, um, or you, know, you, can, you can just avoid it entirely using it or you can use technical construction for exchangeability. I think these are ways to, to uh, cover this if you have a conservative interpretation or you can go to the liberal interpretation. You can say there's no explicit wording or uh, case law interdicting tvoization. So you can say implementation is possible, especially, especially if it's unavoidable from a technical point of view. So these are two ways in the middle. And you can say you can have an indifferent interpretation. You can say up to, up to now, most of the legal claims um, based on a copyleft issue um, or not, um, we're not touching the uh, tvoization. So 
the compliance with copyleft is uh, was the main goal. So you can say, okay, this is I'm I'm indifferent on that. So what I put up here is okay, that might be risky. Um, if you look at the original case TiVo uh, versus Linux or Linux versus TiVo, so. I think we have two very extreme positions, the panicked interpretation and the very indifferent uh, interpretation where they say, okay, who, don't, who, who, who cares? I think these are not the right ways to look at it. Therefore, and that's, for that, that's why I framed uh, the both positions here is probably more going towards position two and three. And you have to look at the legal risks and how you may find a way to cope with it. All right. Yes. The area of conflict which we have been touching already this morning um, is uh, with regard to TVization is that, and this is probably not only applying to the automotive industry, is that developers want to secure a software against manipulation. As Eben also mentioned, you want to protect your IP and implement certain technical features without showing it, showing everything to your competitors. That's important for us. But on, the, on, a, on another point, which is also important, there's a legal need for compliance with uh, implemented open source um, components and the uh, underlying software licenses because of potential claims. There might be a claim for damage, um, a claim for callback because you have to bring back your, um, your product in order to rectify to um, exchange you, to bring it into license compliance and for a, a product which is um, sold around the world which is um, uh, um, distributed heavily this can be a quite a high danger um, it could be very cost of uh, cost um, uh, imminent and uh, cost could be very high Sometimes, and this is the another the, the third point, a liberal or conservative um, interpretation regarding the license provisions is possible. So you have to really look at the um, uh, specific case. So the safest option, the legally safest option, if someone says, "Okay, Daniel, what do you? What is your?" Um, uh, interpretation or what's your recommendation if I take a very safe option and I would say yes do not use that um, if we have a t-voiced uh, system um, so a, um, a secured system this could be a, the, really the legal safest option but this is really the question whether this brings us forward as as Mark and Eben rightly mentioned you can also say, you can make sure the user is able to exchange the respective um, open source component with the modified versions of the library and still get a work that will operate properly and to be able to execute modified versions. How you can do that? You can put libraries, and I think it goes a little bit into whatever um, Mark and Eben pointed out, you can, you can put libraries in a separate file system and include them from the signature checks. Um, secure boot, chain of trust, or else. You can give the user the possibility to obtain the signature keys. This is also another possibility. You can offer your code as an object code so the user can make a separate but working version of the software that is then at the end not limited by the delivered um, hardware. So are there ways um, to do that? And that is also all um, 
an issue which relates to the, your understanding of, of software compliance. So I mentioned here the, the four aspects, at least from my um, point of view, as, as I mentioned it already. So you have the security of the system, you have a technical need for a component, you have uh, the protection of IP, know-how, and you have the potential interpretation of licenses. So those are the four components which wringle around the, the open source compliance and you have to find your way of interpreting and a way forward. Sorry. So on the next slide, I put up an attempt for a solution for combining TVization with free and open source software compliance. So on the um, left part, which I put it in a, in a, in a red uh, box, I showed a system. Um, for example, you have a partition one, which represents a file systems combining proprietary and public components, uh, a library. You have an observer, which is um, monitoring a protection by signature, as I mentioned it before, during the runtime of, uh, for safety and security reason. In case of a mismatch, that's exactly what we're talking about. The observer may block the access to and the interaction with the library if protection for partition one is activated. What, it, what does it mean as a result? This means an uncompliance in case of a FOSS license with interdicting of TVization um, as the system will not work with modified versions of the lib file or the library. So at the end of the day, I want to show this is not possible here as if you want to use it in a, in a way as I've put it up here in the, in the red um, box. How could it maybe, or how could it work? Maybe how can it work? You have a component, um, as I mentioned it, lib, it, which is placed in a separate file system partition instead of inclusion, as in the red box, including it into partition one, where, is it need, where it is needed. You can protect the partition lib um, by de deactivating on request of a an user, allowing the exchange. And even if you look at the protection for partition lib, and if this is deactivated, the rest of the system, including partition one, continues to be protected by the observer. I think, and I don't know if we have to discuss that a little bit further, I think that goes a little bit into whatever mark you have been uh, talking about. So that might be a possible solution. This might avoid devoization issues and provide free and open software compliance while still maintaining, and this is a point which I wanna stress, still maintaining security by checking protection status with uh, technically, or if, if technically possible. So the next slide, I wanna talk about the coverage of the TVization requirements. What does it mean operate properly or exec execute um, modified version, execute, sorry, uh, modified versions? If TVization is interdicted, the user must be able to get a work that will operate properly, be able to execute modified versions of the original software system um, cont containing uh, the free and open source software licensed uh, component. As a matter of fact, there is no definition to the extent of this requirement, and maybe we can discuss that a little bit more, and I, want to, I would like to open the discussion on that part as well. So at the end, it, the whole thing is subject to interpretation. Should the software containing the free and open source software component and the combined code still work? Is there a need for a whole embedded system to still work? Or do all 
interaction of the software still have to work. And I put it up in that, uh, in, 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 in that picture here, which starts with a very narrow interpretation. And then it, you can open it up window by window and go from the library and the work itself that uses the library you can go to the process, you can go a step ahead to, to the processor. You can also go to the hardware unit. You can go to the delivered systems, the computer network in an office, but you can also go to the probably most and, and wide interpretation or a set of picture, which is the system and the external services. So where is the frame, where is the, where is the area where you look at it? Is it, and if you look at the smallest um, interpretation or the, the smallest window, where I, as I mentioned it here as uh, point one, the library and the work, of course you can say, okay, if, if you're able to exchange your components, then maybe your library and your work will work but maybe not the entire hardware. Um, and I mentioned um, examples here in under four, so maybe not the entire hardware unit, the computer or its uh, peripherals or the car, but the software as, 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 as is, or as, as you look at, at, the user looks at, he, that, that might work. So that's also a way of interpretation. I, I would like to open the discussions on that, but you can also have that a little bit later, um, looking at it to understand, okay, how would you interpret um, the, the, the license in that way? So this brings me already um, to the end. Um, I think and I hope I showed you that security and safety is really um, of high importance for the car industry. We are in a very highly regulated market where the governments and the, and the, the bodies look to the car because it's, uh, it's not a thing, the car is not something you just put in your pocket or you, or you can use in your pri private environment at home, but a car is something which drives on the road, which can be of a high danger to, to your uh, uh, body and your, your life. So it's heavily regulated. Whenever, and, and I'm, I'm also um, very, very open on whatever I've been, as, as Eben mentioned already, I've been following the whole discussion since 2004. And I always tell also the people within my organization that we, will, we cannot hold up all of that. We have to, we have to be on the, on the track. I want to be part of the whole system because otherwise we might lose, as Eben said, we might lose the track to innovation. So we, I don't want to hold up the whole thing, but we have to, uh, we have to be part of it. Um, I also agree that um, GPL version three we shouldn't hold that up. We should look carefully how we can do that, how we can, uh, how we can um, uh, make it uh, operate properly in, in a car. Um, but I think I don't want to prevent uh, um, technology innovation um, out of our cars. And because I, I say, because I can, I can also take, a, as I said, the very safe way and say, okay, GPL version three, is absolutely um, not uh, permitted in our cars, but I don't want to go to um, j just as a, just as a general rule. I don't want to do that I, because I don't have at the, at, the, at the end of the day I have to go to our board and say, okay, this innovation we are not able to bring that innovation to our cars because there's just a general rule which says okay it's not allowed. So I think we have to take a very differentiated approach um, to the topic and look at it case by case uh, in order to be on the very top part of the innovation, to, to look at it and not to prevent innovation. And I think the more, um, the more people are able to look at a software, the more innovation will be there. There might be developers, very smart people in our, in our company. Um, they might have a certain view on on a, on a technology, on a software, but there might be there might be even smarter people out there, and I think this is something we should use 
and I'm trying to encourage um, my people in our organization um, to do that. So thank you very much for listening to me and hope for a fruitful discussion. Thank you, Daniel. I, what I, I think I would like to do is to get all the voices in to the discussion and then we can take all the questions uh, from multiple angles. I, 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 sh I should just clarify before we move on that nobody ever sued TiVo about anything. Um, what happened uh, in this history was that um, uh, TiVo made a, a, a digital video recorder for home use, which did indeed, as you say, lock down the entire software stack in the box. Uh, and uh, we made GPL3 in the knowledge of the existence of that business model for the production of appliances, which it was the case that my client, Mr. Stallman, did not like. Uh, so we began making GPL3 with a requirement that users be able to install modified versions of GPL software. And my client made anti-TVOization the label under which that operated, which of course put a particular company uh, in the headlights. I, I, I don't think that Donald Trump learned about tweeting against Amazon from Richard Stallman. Indeed, I don't think Donald Trump has ever learned anything from Richard Stallman. But to be a lawyer for a guy who is singling out particular companies raises certain I found myself one day in conversation with the general counsel of TiVo, Max Ochoa, as he then was, I mean, he's still Max Ochoa, but he no longer works at TiVo. Uh, and Max said, look, you know, if you guys would agree to drop all this anti-TiVoization stuff, we would stop encrypting the movies on the hard drive. And I said, gee, Max, that won't help. We're not the Free Movie Foundation. It's the Free Software Foundation. What we're concerned about is people's ability to modify the software in the device so they can fool around with making it work better for them. Oh, he said, we could never permit that because then they wouldn't take the program guide. I said, you mean that Andrew Tridgell in Australia is going to modify his TiVo and he will decide to do without the program guide? That's one guy. Aunt Sally will never do that. No, says Max, you don't understand. We lose so much money on each piece of hardware we sell that if they don't take the program guide, even one user doesn't take the program guide service from us, then we're out of business. I said, well, Max, look, here's the problem that we have. We make free software. We do the very best we can. We give it to everybody to use for whatever reasons that they want in any way they please, and we don't charge them. You're asking me to accept a terrible tax on our business model so that you can sell tabletop supercomputers below cost. This is not actually a really good outcome for either one of us. You, you, selling hardware below cost is not a good long-term business. And um, putting us into deep trouble, so that's really in the end what TiVoization was about for TiVo. It was securing a service monopoly connected with hardware <laughs> sold below cost. A 21st century business model that isn't very good and that BMW or Audi would never accept. Nobody ever will lose money on selling the car so that they can make a service for it. They want services, I grant you, but the car must be profitable. So my question really, I think, will turn out to be, what is it that is the stake in locking down all the software in the car, and can we help? What I think we have now seen is that what Mark and I are talking about is a version of your partitioning structure on steroids meant to work a thousand times better for you. And that we are really saying, we now have technology on the shelf for you that would allow you to achieve the kind of control that you want in a very highly potentiated way so that you could both protect the things you need to protect and allow tinkering with the things that it wouldn't hurt you to allow. And then all of a sudden, the licenses would cease to mean very much to you because you would have the level of control that you need over the technology in order to have the level of control you need in your business. But the problem is TiVoization is an all or nothing idea. I lock it all down or I let it all out. And now what we really need is very fine-grained stuff and it's not in the language of the licenses it's in the packaging of the software. That's where I think the conversation is at this moment, which is why we really need Jeremiah, because Jeremiah is the person who lives exactly in the middle of that discussion. 